Our heart is the body's engine room, beating on average 3 billion times throughout a person's lifetime. With blood being pumped over a network of vessels stretching 60,000 miles in length, it keeps us supplied with nutrients and oxygen while removing harmful wastes. A heart evolves through several stages in the mother's womb, resembling a fish's heart, then a frog's, and then a snake, before finally adopting the four-chambered human heart. In our last lesson, we looked at plant tissue's role in transporting water and nutrients in plants. In this lesson, we'll be looking at transport in humans, where we will examine the role of different components in blood to the structure of the heart and the blood vessels. Remember to like, subscribe and post your questions in the comments box below. These are the specification points we'll be covering. In today's lesson, we want to be able to describe the components of blood and their roles, be able to understand how the immune system responds to the disease, be able to understand how vaccinations work, be able to describe the structure of the heart and how it functions, and be able to understand how the structure of arteries, veins and capillaries relate to their function. As a starter, what is the job of the phloem? Describe the structure of the xylem. Explain how transpiration causes water to be pulled up the stem. You can pause the video while you think. For question one, the phloem transports sucrose and amino acids up and down the plant in a process called translocation. For question two, the xylem consists of elongated cells arranged end to end to form a continuous vessel. They have no cytoplasm and their walls are coated with a chemical called lignin, which waterproofs them. For question three, transpiration is the evaporation of water from the aerial parts of the plant. It provides a suction effect, which pulls water from the roots to the top of the plant. <laughs> The human circulatory system is made up of the heart, which is a muscular organ and is responsible for pumping blood around the body. The blood, which is the body's transport medium, and the blood vessels, which transport blood away or towards the heart, as well as through our organs. In animals, there are two main types of circulatory system. A single circulatory system, where blood is pumped from the heart to the gas exchange organ, and then directly around the body. You can see this type of system in fish where blood is pumped to the gills, where they collect oxygen, and then this oxygen-rich blood is sent to the rest of the body. The second type of circulatory system is one we see in humans. This is called the double circulatory system. Blood is pumped from the heart to the gas exchange organs, such as the lungs, and then back to the heart and then pump to the rest of the body. In a double circulatory system, such as that found in humans, there are two parts the pulmonary circulation, which carries the oxygenated blood, which is blood lacking in oxygen, leaves the right side of the heart via the pulmonary arteries, making its way towards the lungs where blood becomes oxygenated, meaning it becomes saturated with oxygen. This oxygenated blood returns to the left side of the heart via the pulmonary vein. The second part to the double circulatory system is the systemic circulation. Oxygenated blood leaves the heart's left side by the aorta. Here it is sent around the body. Once oxygen has been deposited, it then returns to the right side of the heart via the vena cava as deoxygenated blood. A double circulatory system is more efficient and you can maintain a higher pressure than you would in a single circulatory system. This is important for blood moving around an entire human. When looking at the heart's internal structure, we can see that it's made of four chambers, two atria at the top and two ventricles at the bottom. These chambers are separated by valves which can open and close, allowing blood to move from one chamber to the next. There's also valves located at the points where blood exits the heart, located here in the diagram. Now let's look at how blood actually moves through the heart itself. First blood will enter the right side of the heart via a vein called the vena cava. Contraction of the walls of the atrium increases the pressure in the chamber, moving blood into the right ventricles. The right ventricle contracts, 
increasing the pressure forcing blood into the pulmonary artery, where blood makes its way to the lungs to pick up oxygen in gas exchange for carbon dioxide. From the lungs, blood enters the left side of the heart via the pulmonary vein. As the left atria contracts, it increases pressure and blood moves into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, its contractions increase the pressure, causing blood to move into the aorta to travel to the entire body. Although we have described the journey of blood from the right to the left side, in reality blood is moving simultaneously through both sides of the heart. We can see that here. If you look at the left ventricle, you can see that the walls are more muscular than the right ventricle. This is an essential structural feature as the left side of the heart is responsible for moving blood to the entire body, so it needs to generate a greater force during contraction. Now let's take a look at the outside of the heart. Here you can see some vital blood vessels called the coronary arteries. These arteries supply oxygen rich blood to the heart muscles. The natural resting heart rate is controlled by a group of cells in the right atrium known as the pacemaker cells. An electrical signal is generated from here which spreads across the heart causing it to beat. Fatty plaque containing cholesterol can form in the coronary arteries. This can cause the narrowing of blood vessels, reducing the blood supply to the heart, resulting in coronary heart disease. Factors that lead to coronary heart disease include poor diet, a lack of exercise, stress, smoking, high blood pressure, or it could be hereditary. People who develop coronary heart disease can go on to have a heart attack, a stroke, or angina. <laughs> Both exercise and adrenaline can affect the heart rate. During exercise, there's an increase in oxygen demand, especially in your muscles, which need oxygen to carry out aerobic respiration to have the energy to contract. To supply your muscles with the oxygen, your heart must beat faster. An increase in heart rate also allows waste products to be removed. The medulla is the brain area that controls heart rate. When we exercise, we produce more carbon dioxide from aerobic respiration. Receptors in the aorta and the carotid artery, which is the artery leading to the head, detect this carbon dioxide. This sends electrical impulses via sensory neurons to the medulla. The medulla responds by sending impulses along nerves which stimulate the heart to beat faster. When carbon dioxide levels return to normal, nerves from the medulla cause the heart rate to drop. Your adrenal glands release adrenaline during times of stress or fear. It prepares your body for the fight or flight response. It targets vital organs, increasing the heart rate and boosts oxygen and glucose delivery to the brain and muscles. Glycogen is also converted to glucose in the liver cells, increasing blood glucose. An increased heart rate and glucose provide oxygen and glucose needed for respiration. This provides energy needed for muscles to contract. <laughs> There are three main types of blood vessels. These are the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. In the artery, blood moves at higher pressure away from the heart. The lumen of the artery is also small, which is essential for generating high pressure. Arteries also have connective tissue, which provides strength to them, such as collagen. If we look at the artery, it has thick muscular walls with elastic fibers, these elastic fibers allow the arteries to stretch and recoil, maintaining the pressure in them. Looking at veins, their walls are less muscular and contain less elastic fibers, which is not needed as they carry blood back towards the heart at low pressure. Their lumen is also larger than those of the arteries. As blood is moving at low pressure against gravity, the vein also has valves that prevent the backflow of blood. Finally, the capillaries, they have no muscle or elastic fibers and their walls are only one cell thick. They are permeable so that substances are able to transfer between the blood and cells. Their primary role is to carry blood through organs, bringing blood close to every cell in that organ. <laughs> In this diagram, you can see the structure of the circulatory system. On the right side of the diagram, we have all the blood vessels which carry blood, which is oxygenated, meaning it takes oxygen-rich blood. On the left side, in blue, are all the blood vessels that carry blood that is deoxygenated, meaning blood which is lacking in oxygen. I have already talked about the top part of the diagram involving the heart and the lungs, so I won't mention that again. The hepatic artery 
supplies blood to the liver and the hepatic vein transports blood away from the liver. The mesentery artery carries blood towards the intestines. Blood leaving the intestine does so via the hepatic portal vein, passing through the liver and the hepatic vein. The renal arteries take blood to the kidneys and blood exiting the kidneys does so via the renal vein. The human blood is a tissue, approximately 41% of it is composed of red blood cells, 4% white blood cells, and platelets and plasma make up 55%. Plasma transports carbon dioxide, digested food, urea, hormones, and heat. The red blood cells are responsible for transporting oxygen around the body, and they have several vital adaptations that help them do this. They contain hemoglobin, an iron-containing protein that combines with oxygen. In one red blood cell, there are approximately 250 to 270 million hemoglobin molecules. Each hemoglobin combined to four oxygen molecules. They have no nucleus, and this allows them to have many hemoglobin molecules. They are small and flexible so that they can fit through narrow blood vessels and they have a biconcave shape which maximizes their surface area for oxygen absorption. White blood cells defend the body from pathogens. For IgCC, you must remember two types, the lymphocytes, which release antibodies, and phagocytes, which ingest pathogens. Let's look at how phagocytes work. The phagocyte is attracted to pathogens due to chemicals it secretes. The pathogen binds to receptors on the phagocyte. The pathogen is engulfed by the phagocyte, producing a phagosome. Lysosomes found inside of the phagocyte release digestive enzymes into the phagosome. This then digests the pathogen. The phagocytes are then free to repeat the process. Let's now take a look at how lymphocytes work. Lymphocytes detect markers on the pathogen called antigens. Even our normal cells contain antigens, but it's those markers that the lymphocytes recognized as being foreign that causes Y-shaped proteins called antibodies to be released. These antibodies have a complementary shape to the antigens which they stick to. Once the antibodies bind to the pathogen, there are three things that can happen. The bacteria will either burst open and die, it labels the pathogen so that it's recognized more easily by phagocytes, or it can stick pathogens together in clumps so that they can be easily engulfed by phagocytes. Antibodies can also neutralize toxins produced by pathogens. Your lymphocytes can make memory cells which remain in your blood. These memory cells can quickly produce antibodies should your body re-encounter the same pathogen. It is the discovery of being able to create memory cells that led to vaccinations being developed. Vaccinations offer protection against diseases that we may encounter over the course of our lifetime. In step one, a dead or inactive form of the pathogen is injected into the patient. Step two, the injected pathogen triggers an immune response. Your lymphocytes detect the antigens on the pathogen, releasing antibodies which destroy it. In step three, memory cells remain in your body. So should you encounter that pathogen again, you can quickly produce antibodies to destroy it. Our final component of blood is platelets. When a person becomes injured, platelets in the blood will detect the wounded area and bind to the site. As platelets bind to the injured area, they change shape to their activated shape. They also release chemicals that cause soluble fibrinogen proteins to form a mesh of insoluble fibrin fibers across the wound. Once one platelet binds, this triggers more platelets to attach to the injured area, thus causing clumping. Red blood cells also get stuck in the fibrin mesh, forming a clot. This process prevents blood loss and the entry of microorganisms. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the components of the blood and their roles. Be able to understand how the immune system responds to disease. Be able to understand how vaccinations work. Be able to describe the structure of the heart and how it functions. And be able to understand how the structure of the arteries, veins, and capillaries relate to their function. In our next lesson, we'll be looking at excretion in plants. Please remember to like, subscribe, and post any questions in the comments box below. Thank <laughs> you.